A reading from the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during these days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, (coughs) saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. This is the word of the Lord. Nothing could be worse than waking up to realize that you can't see. For me, I stumbled out of my bedroom one morning and I could not open my left eye. Everything was in the right place, no blood, but I couldn't get my eyelid to stay open for more than a couple of seconds. It was the day after I had spent multiple days outside with a chainsaw. Now, I had no business cutting down trees with a chainsaw, but it was my senior year of college, and I would do just about anything to earn a little bit of extra money during the summer. So, when I was asked to cut down some trees for cash, I couldn't say no. Having felled zero trees before, and having used a chainsaw a grand total of zero times, I donned a face mask and protective gloves with the confidence that only a college student can muster. And I spent a few days cutting down some dead pine trees. They felled, they fell successfully, and I successfully repaired the neighbor's fence crushed by one tree. (laughs) The next morning, the pain in my eye, though, would not allow me to keep it open. And because I live in the age of Google and WebMD, I was convinced that I was going to be blind for life. Thankfully, I had a mother who talked a little bit of sense into me, told me I had to go to the doctor, and I had an uncle that drove me to the doctor, where I was told that I had simply scratched my cornea. Apparently, some sawdust had made it past that face shield, and my life as a cyclops only lasted about 36 hours. Praise be to God for corneas that are the fastest healing part of our bodies. Ash Wednesday was just a few days ago, but the ashes are already gone. I look around the room this morning and I only see clean foreheads, so I imagine we've all washed our faces by now. But as we begin our spiritual journey through this season of Lent, it seems to me that we may have brushed just a few of those ashes into our eyes. In case you were unable to inaugurate Lent with us on Wednesday, we're beginning this season that George has described for us in which we follow Jesus' journey toward Jerusalem and toward the cross. In these days of sort of liturgical twilight as the lights are going out, we give attention to what we'd usually rather not pay attention to, mortality, Sin, repentance, and self-denial, these are the themes of Lent that point us to a deeper life of faith. 
at an Ash Wednesday service, our normal closing benedictions of peace and blessing are replaced with ashes on our forehead in the words, remember that you are dust, and to dust you will return. These ashes, reminding us that we're dust, remind us that we have been smeared with sin in some way. Darkness is part of our reality, and none of us are quite as perfect as we might like to be. But if we're not careful, in our attempt to look clean, we may just swipe some of these ashes down our face and into our eyes. I think most days sin is a lot like that. It's something on our forehead that might be slightly annoying, but at the end of the day, we wash it off. Sometimes it feels, though, like stain, sin stains just a little bit deeper, and maybe some of us even have some scars from trying to claw the, the stain off of our face. But more often, I find that, that sin is like something in our eyes that we can still see past, but only for a few seconds until the pain forces us to close our eyes again. So in Lent, we have the opportunity to wake up, especially early today, and to recognize that we can't actually see. There's something in our eyes, something that keeps us from seeing as clearly as we might. Our gospel reading this morning tells the story of Jesus' time in the wilderness when he comes face to face with the devil. Now, I know how excited some of you are here at Wilshire. Finally, it's time for a three-point sermon. There are three temptations after all. It's perfect. And uh, maybe today isn't the day, but I think there's, there's a little bit of a unity in these three. So George has, has suggested that perhaps this is actually a Trinitarian story, that the three points are in one, but I better move on. These temptations, I think, pervert something that we already know about Jesus because his stories are fairly familiar to us. Jesus feeds multitudes. Jesus uses a subversive power that changes the ways of the world. And Jesus flips the tables of the temple that were used to profit off of the needy. Jesus was out in the desert, and the devil was trying to impose some ashes of his own on Jesus' face, trying to smear some sin that just might obscure Jesus' vision for what he was going to do. The devil doesn't try to deceive Jesus. That would have been a fool's errand. But instead, his attempt is to misdirect. If you are the Son of God, and I'm not saying you aren't, but if you are, why don't you just feed yourself? Everybody's got to eat. There's nothing wrong with that, is there? But Jesus maintains clear sight. He's focused on his purpose and what kind of Messiah he will be as he begins his ministry. We know that Jesus feeds multitudes. In just a few chapters in the book of Luke, Jesus is going to feed 5,000 people with just a few loaves and a few fish. The devil is right that there is nothing wrong with feeding yourself, but the narrative tells us a bigger story, that Jesus is about providing for the people who have the most need. We know that Jesus uses this power that turns things upside down and that subverts the ways of the world and in fact, in just a few verses, he's going to tell us about good news for the poor and jubilee. But I think you may have heard that sermon already. The devil attempts to get him to embrace 
the power of the world for his own gain, though, while Jesus doesn't want anything to do with that. We know the story that Jesus will overturn the tables where some were preying on the devotion of religious people coming to worship in order to gain a greedy prophet. And the devil tempts him to embrace that monetized religion with some fantastic and crowd-pleasing display as he falls off the Temple Mount only to be snatched out of the air by angels. You see, the devil attempts to obscure the vision of what God is up to in our world. He tries to muddle Jesus' vision for his ministry that he's about to announce in just a couple verses. Good news for the poor, release for the captive, sight for the blind, and freedom for the oppressed. The devil's attempt is to get Jesus to inaugurate a self-serving kingdom rather than the kingdom of God. The Book of Eli is a 2010 movie starring Denzel Washington. If you haven't seen it, it's set after a nuclear war that has turned Earth into a post-apocalyptic wasteland where water is the most valuable commodity left. Eli, the main character, is making his way across what was the United States toward the West Coast, surviving by hunting and scavenging whatever he can find. Eli's book, from the title, is his vocation in the movie. Books are rare. Maybe they've been burned for fuel over the years, but by now most of the world has fallen into illiteracy. But there's this group on Alcatraz Island just off the West Coast that are preserving and reproducing books to maintain some record of humankind. And Eli's plan is to take his book to those people so that they can preserve it. The antagonist named Carnegie is a sort of warlord who controls a water source and therefore has a tight grip on a community that depends on that water. And he has been in search of some book that he has heard about. This book, he has been told, has the magical capability of gathering people together and giving him power like none other. As Eli comes into Carnegie's town, he finds himself in some trouble, and his book becomes known. Carnegie finds out that Eli is carrying the very book that he has been searching for, the Bible. Eli is eventually captured, and he surrenders apparently the final copy of the Bible to Carnegie in order to save the life of a woman named Solera who had helped him and who was traveling with him. So the movie concludes with Carnegie attempting to read this holy book. But as he opens it, he finds that there aren't words printed on the page, but instead patterns of bumps. It's a braille Bible. And while he was obsessed with finding this book, he finds out that he's lost control of the town that he was warlord over. So Eli and Solera row out to Alcatraz Island, having lost the Bible. But Eli is miraculously able to dictate the entire Bible that he has memorized during his journey. And these people on Alcatraz Island are able to type up and reprint copies of the Bible. Pretty great, right? It turns out that Eli was blind the whole time. But somehow he was able to fight and to hunt and to read the Bible. And Carnegie was the one 
with fully functioning eyes, but he was unable to see what was really going on around him. He was unable to see what the Bible was really about. In this season of Lent, it's time for some of us to wake up and realize that we can't see. We have fully functioning eyes, or corrective lenses at least, but sin has the capacity to obscure clear sight. There are still devils on the prowl. There are still sins that blind us. Last summer, the New Yorker published an article that is still timely now, a few months later, and it's about a sociologist's work on why white people are particularly bad about openly talking about racism. Rather than addressing themselves with clear sight, with honesty about our own involvement in some of the implicit bias in our society, they'd rather not talk about it at all. People that look like me can see, after all. We're not the blind ones. But this sociologist claims that it's actually white progressives that have the capacity to do the most harm to communities of color. She says that people who believe they've arrived often devote their energy to making sure other people know they have arrived. To put it in other words, it's those of us who are convinced that we see clearly that have the potential to do harm. Friends, this is the purpose of Lent. Not to smear some dirt on your face and tell you you're a sinner and you should feel bad about it. No, instead, Lent is a time to give us clear sight about ourselves and our world so that God can transform us and make our world new. For many of us, we may think that we've arrived, and we may think that these things aren't an issue for us. Racism doesn't exist anymore, after all. I hear fewer racist epithets. But we know that there are still things that lie just below what we normally put our sight on. And this This racism is just one example, but we know that these temptations Jesus felt are still real for all of us. I'll just feed myself and my own family. Those people aren't really my concern. If I have any privilege, I'll use it to get a promotion so that maybe I can help my family and my church a little bit better. But how much could I really do for people that are really powerless? There's nothing wrong with gaining a little profit. I've earned what I have, and it's not my fault if others haven't prospered. These temptations are probably familiar to many of us. I know they are to me. And friends, this is why we need each other in the season of Lent. We need to gather together as a church community because it's when we come here to this sanctuary to hear words from God that we recognize not simply that we've lost our vision, but that Jesus is the one who can restore our clear sight. You see, when we come together as part of a church and we attend to God, we're given new eyes when we experience God in some way, through looking at Jesus and through the stirring of the Holy Spirit. We're granted the grace of seeing the world in a clear way. Yes, that there are ashes and devils. And we can see that this is not the way 
things should be. We can see that God is still feeding multitudes. God is still upsetting the powers of our world and lifting those who are in the most need. God is still overturning tables in our temples today. So these temptations that Jesus felt may still be among us, blinding us to God's vision for the world, and it may just be easy for us to give in, to live a self-serving life. But as the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness and out of the wilderness back to Galilee, the Spirit is still leading us. We may have a little ash in our eyes, but we are not blind for life. Thanks be to God for the grace of seeing the world through the cross and resurrection, and that like our corneas, our spiritual sense of sight heals quickly when we turn our eyes to Jesus. Our Lenten journey is one of seeking healing for our eyes, that we may see ourselves truly and contribute to a resurrected world. Amen.